Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure. Uh, today is a special show because it is my 250th episode. It is also my great opportunity to interview Dr. Robert Waldinger. I'll tell you all about Dr. Bob in just a moment. A Grace Under Pressure is that show that focuses on what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the commitment we exert toward others. And when you do it from a leadership position and working with leaders, as you will definitely discover that uh, Dr. Bob is, you do it for common cause to bring people together. Welcome, Dr. Robert Waldinger. So, Thank you. Glad to be great. here. Great. I want to tell folks all about you. You are the professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development, and co-author of a wonderful book, The Good Life, which we were going to explore in depth. Uh, you um, received your MD from Harvard uh, Medical School. You're a practicing psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, and you teach psychotherapy for psychiatry residents at Harvard. You're also a Zen master, Roshi, and you teach meditation throughout New England and, frankly, the world. Dr. Robert Waldinger, it is a pleasure to welcome you to Grace Under Pressure. So, Very glad to be here. Uh, Great. The Harvard study has been studied the lives of two generations of individuals and families for almost 80 years, upwards of 80 years. And you have a wonderful line in your book, The Good Life, that says, good relationships keep us, keep us healthier and happier, period. I guess that's the whole interview, right? <laughs> that's it. We're done. Okay. I'll see you. Thanks, Dr. Bob. No, yeah. seriously. Um, you write something which I had not heard before, but I found it thought-provoking. Relationships live within us. What does that mean? I think of relationships as outward, but you say they, they're inward or reside within us. What does that mean? So, Well, it's actually both. I mean, if you think about it, you carry around many of the people you care about inside you all day long. Like you can call up a warm image of a friend, um, of a loved one. Uh, and so in that sense, we carry them around. You carry around a, a warm image of somebody who may have passed away a long time ago. So it's often useful to think about how we carry people with us as we go through the world. And carrying us can be that those memories, or if it's someone passed or a relationship with people, they can be both good and negative. Am I correct? So, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and sometimes we can dwell on the negative. Sometimes we can ruminate on something we're angry about with somebody. Uh, so that's certainly possible. Right. Well, throughout your book, it's, it's it has data, but what really resonates with me are so many stories. But you also have a practical model that I had not encountered before, and it's called the Wiser model. Um, and could you walk us through top line some of the steps uh, of what the Wiser model is? So. Yeah. Well, the wiser model is really just a way of slowing things down when you have a challenging interaction, particularly with another person. So the example I think we give in the book is you get an email from your boss at 5 p.m. saying, I want to see you in my office at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. And that's all it says. And so totally ambiguous. It's like there's a blank space to be filled in. And what we know is that our minds fill in the blanks. And often we fill in the blanks with things that aren't necessarily true. So you could fill in the blank with, my boss is mad at me. Uh, I'm in the doghouse. I'm going to be fired. Or I'm going to be promoted. Or you could fill in with any number of things. And, and the problem with our wonderful minds doing that is that we can often create a story that isn't true when we get this kind of challenging stimulus from somebody else. Could be a, a romantic partner, could be a friend. And so what the wiser model does is it just asks us to slow things down. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't reply right away if you, if you don't have to, but just think, okay, what might be going on? What am I assuming and what do I actually know for a fact? And can I be open to different possibilities for why this person is treating me this way, right? And that's really all the wiser model is. And the oh, idea of learning, learning how 
to kind of see how things play out and, and see how we deal with an ambiguous stimulus like that, and then um, seeing if we can learn from it each time. I like the wiser model. I like what you said, slowing things down. A, a close personal friend of mine <clears throat> might be able to benefit from doing that from time to time, <laughs> Dr. Bob. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and, and part of that is that when we slow things down, and it's it's hard to do because our pace of life is, or at least we so often we feel rushed. So any tips? Well, you're, you teach meditation. Any tips on slowing things down? So. Yeah. I mean, literally take a moment, take a breath, or count backwards from five back to zero. Just anything to interrupt the swirl of thoughts. Of, you know, think about it when you receive an angry email or an angry text and you want to reply right away with something. And, and that's the time to stop and slow down. Actually, what I've learned to do when I possibly can is to sleep on it. When I'm really worried about something or want to respond angrily or unsure about what's going on, I sleep on it. And invariably, the next morning, I'm clearer. It looks better. I have a, a stronger sense of how I want to respond skillfully. I like that. That's it's such so easy to say, but for some people I know, <laughs> that is difficult. Uh, so I, I always like the story of Harry Truman, who would, uh, as president, would be irritated with certain things, and so he, and he's very erudite in his own way, would fire off a letter, but put it in a drawer. <laughs> so. That's right. That's right. So I've heard people say there ought to be a button on my email that says "Do not send." <laughs> Oh, that's a good one. That's a very good one. Now, getting back to the Harvard Adult Study, which is two generations, and there are positive stories, but there are also stories of dysfunction that go from family to family, whatever. Um, how can we, if there is dysfunction, whatever, that can be hard to break. So what have you learned from this study about breaking the habit of familial dysfunction? Well, a lot has to do with who we surround ourselves with as we one of the things that happens when you're when you're raised in a family that operates in a certain way that's like the air you breathe you've never known any other family so you think well that's the way the world is that's the way people are and what we find is that the people who can break a cycle of family dysfunction of maybe family abuse and trauma people who can break that cycle are people who find people who behave differently, you know? So you find a partner who treats you kindly and is not abusive. You find friends who don't judge you, who don't ridicule you if you had people in your family who ridicule. So it's, it's really seeing if you can um, change who you associate with and in that way change your sense of what's possible in relationships with other people. Well, you know, that's, I'm thinking of the, thinking back in the two generations and one of the door, uh, the uh, generations lives in, or both live in Dorchester, which is a working class neighborhood. And so it's harder, you know, it's, it's, I like the way you said family, family is the air in which we breathe and dysfunction is just what we know. So breaking out of that pattern can be extremely difficult. Is, is there something you've learned from the study, this good ways to do it? Um, so. Well, it's, it's broadening your world, right? So it's finding other people. So it's engaging, you know, the kids who did well coming from abusive homes were the kids who found coaches and teachers to mentor them, who found good friends, who, who got involved in activities they cared about. And so they moved some of their investment in life outside of their families. And they, they were able to have, um, activities and other people in their life that develop their talents and their interests in ways that were healthy and not dysfunctional. All right. Now, one of the, you have a phrase, which I like, and I haven't heard it coupled together quite like this, but I think it helps us uh, navigate this world and you call it the power of generosity. What do you mean by that phrase, Dr. Bob? So yeah, well, it's well, demonstrated, even with research, not just with our 
spiritual leaders, but, but research tells us that when we are generous, we feel better and we're happier. We feel like our lives are more meaningful. So when we help people, we actually take care of ourselves. In fact, the Dalai Lama has, has said, the wise, selfish person takes care of other people. Uh, we know that being generous makes us feel like our lives are better. What powerful. Uh, who's going to argue with the Dalai Lama? <laughs> so, but but you know, I like the way he says that because he used the word selfish. And so, but he turned it around toward focusing on others. Now, Adam Grant. Well, because, wrote, because what goes around comes around. So if you are more generous to other people, it comes back to you. Oh, that's a, one, that's a powerful thought. So now um, I'm somebody that believes that we can create community at work, the good life. What is your take on that, Dr. Bob? So. Well, we can, and it's been shown to be possible, but it takes active work to do that. So there are many organizations where people feel isolated where people don't make personal relationships and we know that the people who have friends at work are better performers they're happier there's they're less likely to leave for other jobs but in a gallup survey recently only 30 percent of workers said they have a friend at work they can talk to about personal matters so really the issue is how can an organization how can leaders get behind and structure programs where they encourage people to make friends rather than considering friendships at work to be a distraction from the bottom line, realizing that it actually enhances the bottom line. That's a good advice for leaders. So how can a leader, if, if a leader is concerned with um, morale or I mean, not morale as it relates to the work, but uh, workforce happiness, workforce satisfaction, and says, I want to engage and allow my people to engage more uh, with one another. Any suggestions you have? Is it a program? Is it a method? What have you discovered? So. Well, the first thing is to model it. Uh, so have the leader do that. Um, and then also to learn what good practices are. So there are good practices. There are programs that could be created that, that might be right for a particular organization. And it, and it takes some reaching out and, and finding out what are other organizations doing? What has worked and what might work for your organization? The important thing is not just to leave it to your HR people because they don't have the power. They don't have the leadership uh, positions to model this. So the, the first thing is to model it. And uh, that means modeling being interested in other people's lives, curiosity about your colleagues and your workers. It means modeling vulnerability, not knowing. It means modeling learning to get help from other people. All that is part of enhancing relationships with other people. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, seeking help. Um, and uh, we know as, as you're a practicing psychiatrist that when leaders make it safe for others to seek men, uh, address mental health issues that makes it com more comfortable for others to follow suit i'm sure that's you've seen that in your experience have you not so oh absolutely and in fact it's one of the reasons why now when celebrities um are public about getting depressed or being anxious or needing some mental health care it has a huge effect on the world because people say, well, you know, if, if that superstar athlete is having trouble and gets help and gets better, that I could do that too, right? Yeah. So if a leader uh, actually is open about it, and we can do that without sharing more than is necessary, mm -hmm. but if a leader is open about it, it can be a huge help. I mean, if you think about uh, Princess Catherine now sharing that she has cancer, and that she's getting treatment. What a boon to all the people who might be ashamed or try to hide the fact that they need help, medical help. Uh, because she's saying, no, I'm gonna be upfront about this and I'm gonna talk to people about it. There's nothing shameful about it. 
And the same goes for mental health. Well, this is sadly, as you well know, because the world in which you live, there's always this sadly this bifurcation between physical health and mental health when actually they're conjoined or they're one in this, not one in the same, but we're all human. So um, I, I'm making it safe for others to seek that help is so essential. So. Yeah. So um, fundamental to community or, or at work or at home or church, wherever, um, is the sense of belonging. Uh, we all want to belong, I think. Um, and um, uh, a few of us may be hermits, but most of us want to belong to something. So um, what have you gained from your insight about fostering the sense of belonging? So, Well, as you say, it's super important. And the people who were the best at relationships, and that means the people who stayed happiest and healthiest in our 85-year study, were the people who belonged, who made sure that they joined clubs and, you know, religious organizations or uh, political campaigns, anything, just to do the things they cared about with other people. And that that's actually the surest way to make new friends. You know, volunteer for something uh, where you see the same people over and over again, and it gives you a great way to start conversation because you're doing something that you both care about. Um, it's the you know, it's one of the reasons why we tell our kids when they when they go away to college, join clubs, join, get involved in activities because we know that's how people make friends, and it doesn't stop when you're a teenager. Adults need this as well. I'm glad you mentioned that because, yes, adults do that. And sadly, we are in an, a time when the Surgeon General has identified loneliness as actually a health hazard. And so um, and so belonging fosters that. So if I'm uh, um, uh, getting maybe further along, people, in, uh, I know that the, in the UK, there's a minister of uh, loneliness or fostering positive engagement. Um, what have you seen that works on a uh, societal level or a community level to address lon loneliness? So. Well, there are a lot of different causes of loneliness. So one remedy doesn't fit everybody. And that's something that's important to name that some people have physical illness and they can't get out. Some people have anxiety when they're around other people. Some people are just geographically isolated. Some people live in anonymous high-rise apartments and don't know a soul. But I do think that our environments can be structured to make it more likely that we'll talk to strangers. You know, if we have walkable neighborhoods, if we have places, friendly, warm, inviting places to sit, to hang out, you know, public walkways and parks and... Uh, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we can structure neighborhoods. You know, we, we all have seen neighborhoods that are completely empty because everybody's in these spaces where, um, where they're anonymous and there's no place to socialize out in the community. We are trying to change that as people are beginning to understand that how we structure our physical spaces really matters for how likely we are to connect with one another. Great. Now I want to switch gears to you personally here because you are a Zen master, a Roshi, uh, if I uh, am correct. Yep. And so, uh, and you teach meditation. Yep. I perceive meditation as an amateur meditator is inward directed, but you essentially work communitarian work, at least in the adult uh, uh, Harvard adult study. So how can meditation help us uh, address loneliness or foster community. So, well, meditation does it indirectly. So, when we meditate, you sit down and you pay attention to your own experience, your own feelings and thoughts. And then you begin to realize, oh my gosh, everybody has these kind of messy minds and these complex feelings. And meditation often involves. Uh, a gradual process of greater self-acceptance and with that greater acceptance of other people with all their quirks, with all their foibles. And that allows us to be more open to other people, more curious about other people. 
uh, and also, if I'm not incorrect, teaches us the the power of presence, being in the moment. Yeah. And, okay. And if I'm in the moment, then I am open to another, and assuming there's other people around. So. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Now I want to go back to the study for a second, and um, it's been going on as you mentioned, 85 years. Are there things? that you have changed in their learning at year 50 versus year 85 something is how is what's the perspective of that dr bob so, i'm not sure i understand the question what, what well I mean, it's been going on for 85 years which is right. among the longest if not the longest study of its kind in the world so were there conclusions drawn in 1960 that are reinforced in 2024 or vice versa so, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, first of all, uh, the best thing about a longitudinal study is you don't know how it's going to turn out. And so we found that some things we predicted in the 1960s for people didn't turn out to be the case in those lives. Lives take very interesting, unexpected turns. Um, but the one thing we've done is we add new scientific methods as the years go on and science progresses. So for example, um, the study started in 1938. We now draw blood for DNA analyses and messenger RNA. And those things weren't even imagined in 1938. We put people into the MRI scanner and look inside their brains. That was thought to be like something from fantasy land in 1938. Nobody dreamed we'd ever know how to do that. So the interesting thing is to be able to use new methods to study well-being methods that that nobody could have imagined when the study started right well it's reading a story it's, it's actually this reassurance but the the power of relationship which is so obvious <laughs> that is it we're forgetting it or is, does our personality get in the way or circumstance what what have you seen that is the biggest obstacle to this is there a one. Well, one is that, that relationships are like hidden in plain sight, right? They're, they're always there. We've never been in, we've never been alive without having relationships. So we don't think of them as something you have or you don't have until there's a problem and we realize, oh, we don't, we don't feel connected to people. We're, we're lonely. And, and it's often hidden because the society gives us all these messages about what's important in life. And usually they have to do with buying things, consuming, right? You buy the right car, you buy the right face cream, you whatever. You know, this is how you're going to have a good life. You become a billionaire, you're going to be happy. And even though we all know that that's not true, and there's really good science to show it's not true, um, the culture keeps giving us those messages. And it's one of the reasons why we say, well, I got to work hard because I got to achieve a lot. Uh, and, and my relationships, they'll take care of themselves. But it turns out that's not the truth. They don't take care of themselves. They take work, daily work. We talk about social fitness in the book. It's an analogy to physical fitness. Like you, just as you work out to keep your body strong, you actively take care of your relationships to keep your relationships strong. I like the concept of social fitness. So are there exercises we should do or practices that we should integrate into our lives to be socially fit? So, Yeah. Keep contact with people. Like keep reaching out to people, email people, text people regularly saying, just thinking about you, wanted to say hi or checking in about how they're doing. Um, for the people who are really important, make regular dates with them. Make sure that you have a once a month lunch with that friend who you don't want to lose touch with no matter what, or you take a walk with your spouse instead of doing the same old thing and plopping down in front of the TV right after dinner. Uh, have time to really be together. Okay. Well, you have a, a, a personal story, you and your co-author um, in the good book. Uh, Mark Schultz, um, that you tell the story of your relationship, your colleagues, and then something changed. Can you elaborate on that? So, so. 
Well, really, we became personal friends. So first we started collaborating on research and and then we, you know, naturally because we were talking many times a week in, in the beginning uh, about our research, we started to talk about our families, our kids, and uh, began to really participate in each other's lives more. So we're, you know, he's one of my closest friends and he's been that way for over 30 years. That's, and but you, uh, if I remember correctly from the book, there was a moment when uh, one of your spouses had a medical emergency, and I think you uh, it was his wife, and you went to visit her in the hospital, and that changed the dynamic of your relationship or deepened it. So, I think it deepened it. I mean, we were already getting to be good friends, but I think my showing up in that way really meant a lot, and I think it's a good reminder to us all, like when in doubt, show up. Like, should I go or not? Do it, right? If it occurs to you, uh, show up. I, I like that. Just don't ask, just do it. And that's important. Um, Dr. Bob, it has been such a pleasure talking to you and where time is racing along. And um, as you know, I have a practice of asking every guest a story about grace. And frankly, your book is full of stories of grace. Um, is there one story that you would like to share from your life or what you have observed? So. Well, there are just so many gifts that, you know, I've received in my life. I mean, it's kind of countless. Like <laughs> I'm the fourth director of the longest study of adult life ever done. That means that three directors before me gave me this enormous gift. You know, I'm standing on their shoulders and my predecessor, George Valiant, um, really trusted me with this thing that he had devoted his life to and his predecessors before him. So that's just one small example. My Zen teachers, my family, right? They, I, I, can't, uh, I can't count the number of gifts I've received without expectation of any return. Okay. That's a powerful thing. And I like the multi-layer of it. It's both professional, personal, and of course, familial. So um, Dr. Bob, how can people find you and your great book, uh, The Good Life? Yeah, well, probably the best place is my website. So it's robertwaldinger.com. Uh, that's the easiest place. And you can get links to papers from the study, scientific papers. You can get links to the book, to my newsletter, uh, it's, it's all there. Well, great. Um, Dr. Robert Waldinger, it has been such a pleasure to speak to you today. And I thank you for being a guest. My, 250, uh, my 250th show. Wow. Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. With that, we're going to go out. Then.